بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Welcome to our, I think what's what's now our fourth presentation for Ilm Tree Academy. And the purpose of these presentations, you may have some of you may have seen them before, is to introduce the general community, people residing in the Prince George's uh, County area, to Ilm Tree Academy, which is going to be, inshallah, a new uh, great school, Islamic private school. Uh, with Hifth integration and with uh, an Arabic uh, fluency program and inshallah will be based in uh, PGMA and what I wanted to do was be before we kind of cut through the slides inshallah and then we will leave the Q&A for later on because a lot of you will have questions is what we normally do at least traditionally speaking with this presentation is we begin with this with this adage with this maxim that you see behind me it takes a village to raise a child it takes a village to raise a child can anyone tell me what you think that means? And specifically in the context of your children's education, because we don't live in a village. But what does that mean? What does that mean to you? Hmm? Of Collective, yeah. Really what it is is that it, it takes a village to, take a to raise a child means that the upbringing of a child, the education of the child is not something that is solely entrusted on the mother or on the father or the school, or anyone, the grandparents, not, not anyone being, what that means is that it's the collective responsibility of all the people that have a stake in that child's education, that have a concern for the child, let's put it that way. So the reason why this is important for us to understand is because the Muslim community generally, not picking on American Muslims or anybody, the Muslim community generally <clears throat> has a problem in the upbringing of our children, which is that we like to offload the education of our child to someone else. So if I'm a bad parent, if I'm an irresponsible father, right, and I think that despite me being bad, if I engage in things that I should not be engaging in, right, business transactions, other personal vices and things like that, and I send my child to an Islamic school, then my job as a father is done because now my child will grow up hafid of Quran, knowing hadith, knowing fiqh and all these things, and I've done my job as a parent, now my child will hopefully grow up not to be like me because Despite being addicted to my faults, what I want is that I don't want my child to end up like me. That generally doesn't happen. Your child goes to Islamic school, sees a certain way of the, sees a certain worldview. She may wear hijab. She may only wear hijab in school, not in other places. Your son may learn about uh, the different uh, hadith and ayat. But then when they come home, when you as a parent fail, when I as a parent fail to give them an Islamic environment at home, if they have unrestricted access to the internet and I don't monitor them, if they have unrestricted access to television, to cable, you know, cable TV and things like that, all these things which in and of itself are an influence that counter what they learn in school, then one of two things happens. Either your child loses his interest altogether in Islamic education because now he wants to be like them, you know, the role models that they follow on, on this, in this media, Lady Gaga and, and whatever else they have out there, or they actually learn in a very, very clever way how to be a hypocrite from a very young age and we play a part in them being that we, we actually teach them how to be two-faced. So they go to the school that we pay a lot of money for and they wear the hijab and they say nice things and they, and they say subhanallah, walhamdulillah, all the buzzwords, Allahu Akbar. And then they come out of school and then they're a different way. And we are the ones that, are, are, are the ones that teach them, okay, put this mask on when you go here, when you come home, be this way because we're not, doing, we're not giving the environment that the school is giving you. The truth is that a greater responsibility of, you know, than our teachers who are educators, professional educators, even for us in the capacity of parents, even though we're not educators, it is, just, we are, it is incumbent on us to give our child a holistic environment. We have to replicate the environment which we see as the ideal environment. If we care enough to not send our children to public school, if we actually pay money to send them to private school, we have to make sure that there is no contradiction in their upbringing that they don't, they don't learn to be two-faced, that when they, when they come home, we, we do the best that we can. We may not be Hufad of Qur'an, we may not be Qur'a and scholars, but we have to replicate that environment. So the responsibility of your child's education, whether it's Hifth of Qur'an or anything else, much of it falls on you. You have to make sure that your child is, is given that environment wherever he or she is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts a lot of emphasis on the status of knowledge. There are hadith, al-ulama, uh, warathat uh, al-anbiya and others, that the scholars are the inheritors of prophets. But even before you go into hadith, if you look at the Qur'an itself, when we make dua, it is permissible to make dua for anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made jais for you, that has, Allah has made acceptable for you. But in terms of asking for increase, give me more, give me more, I want more, I want more, 
nothing has been taught to us where, when we ask for a continuous increase up until the point that we die in terms of material wealth, in terms of status and recognition, in terms of fame. The only thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in that regard where you keep asking and you're not greedy, you keep begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for more, no matter how much you have, are scholars who had so much of it and never felt that they had enough is ilm. وَقُلْ رَبِّي زِدْنِي عِلْمًا And say, oh Allah, give me more and more knowledge. When your child goes to an Islamic school, whether it's ilm tree or elsewhere, they should have in them the desire to acquire more and more and more knowledge. Because when knowledge is acquired, and it's truly acquired in a humble way, you never see yourself as a person who's attained the best and now you're all knowledgeable. You always see yourself as ignorant, you always want more and more and more. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages that as a dua in the Quran, the second ayah. وَفَوْقَ كُلَّ ذِي عَلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ And above every person who has knowledge is someone who has more knowledge. You're saying this from Surah Yusuf. Musa alayhi salam, there's a story about Musa alayhi salam that so one of the Bani Israel came to him and said, who's the most knowledgeable person in the world right now? So Musa alayhi salam, based on what he knew, he gave a very factual answer. He said, it's probably me. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him a very, very uh, powerful lesson and had him introduced to Khidr. We do not say that Khidr has a different status than Musa alayhi salam. There's no need for us to go into that. But the reality is that Khidr was given certain knowledge that even Musa alayhi salam had not been given. The, the point is that no matter how much you learn, no matter how much knowledge you attain, because of the humility that, necessit that necessarily comes with knowledge, realize that there may be somebody out there who has more knowledge than you. Maybe in a different discipline, but they may have been given other gifts that you haven't been given. So that humility is an aspect of knowledge and that is found in the Quran as well. And lastly, of course, uh, Iqra. بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنَ الْأَقْرَ إِقْرَ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكْرَمَ الَّذِي عَلَّمَ ذِي الْقَلَمْ عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا عَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches by the pen that which man does not know, which means that instruments that, that document knowledge, instruments that record knowledge, even though we are an ummah of an unlettered prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors the tools that are used to disseminate knowledge. Back then it was the pen and the lawh, which is a tablet. Today it could be a database. It could be something that you document electronically. The bottom line is any tools that are used to document knowledge and to spread knowledge are things that the believer is connected to from the very beginning of the Qur'an. I mean, that's what the Qur'an begins with. Allah mentions the pen. So we have to show a lot of regard for knowledge. We have to show respect for knowledge. A believer doesn't stomp on books and throw things across the room from which he or she could benefit from. So all these things have to be imbibed in our children to have, to have respect and regard and veneration for knowledge, generally speaking. Now, of course, you can all read this, and our mission statement is, is pretty general. Uh, most schools have, have a very similar mission, mission statement. And essentially what we're saying, at least the first part of it, that is, is that we want to, we aspire to be a school that as we teach your children modern contemporary education, which they will benefit from in, in this society that they live in, which is a predominantly non-Muslim society, but on top of that, inshallah, we aspire to, uh, you know, inculcate them with Qur'an, with Arabic, which is the gateway to hadith, as we know. We want to produce the outcome of our efforts, the results that we basically show as our proof, are the children that graduate from this academy, inshallah, even though we're beginning from first to fourth or fifth grade. And we just don't want to have people, and, and I spoke with somebody at Iswa, and, and, and he said to me, are you, are you, uh, is your objective to produce walking encyclopedias? And that's, that's part of our objective. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I respect uh, Imam you know, Zakir Naik and others. Which is good. You want to have children that have a lot of knowledge, but you also want to, for them to be able to demonstrate that knowledge. You want, to have, you want to see people that are able to be examples of that knowledge as well. So character is important. We want to have children that not only have a lot of Islamic texts memorized, but that, that has to be exemplified in their character. They have to have good adab. They have to have akhlaq. They have to have ihsan. If a person doesn't, you can. If it is painful for you to talk to someone because they're so rude, or because they can't just they can't stop backbiting, they can't stop using foul language. Then what good is in their in memorization of the Quran for you and for them? So we have to make sure that we all make an effort as parents and as teachers that we have children that when they internalize that knowledge, that also comes out again through the pores, literally, that they exemplify that knowledge. And lastly, and this is an area which in a post 9/11 America has become very important which is that we have to produce people that are not just great at interacting with Muslims because character development could be that I'm really nice to you but I act like a total weirdo in, with the general community which is a predominantly non-Muslim community. That's not what we want. So the last aspect is that we need to have people, uh, young brothers and sisters that have in, the, in themselves a desire to be involved in the community. We are done 
We're done with producing people that live in a Muslim bubble, that come to the masjid in a thobe and that's what they want to be because it's a very comfortable, safe and secure environment. That's true. But if you are producing children that are not able to interact with the outside world, then that is not the example of our Prophet ﷺ. Because our Prophet, when he produced people like Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and, and Omar, and they were people that could interact with the Quraysh. They could interact with the Persians. They could interact with the Jews of Medina. They could interact with the Byzantine and others. They were not people that were just comfortable in, in halaqat. So we have to make sure that even though we have this internal focus on our brothers and sisters, these people have to be holistic Muslims. Because we don't live in Saudi Arabia. We don't live in Pakistan and Egypt. We live in a society where the, the predominant audience is going to be non-Muslims. So community involvement, which is that last point there, community interaction is important and we hope to, inshallah, produce that as well. Now, I'm not going to go through everybody's bio, but the bottom line is that this information is on our website and I'll share that with you at the end. But on our team, inshallah, generally the, the people, th there's the business side of things, which I'm a part of, I'm not an educator, but we have people that are uh, on the business side of the academy that are hoping to let it be, become something which is financially sustainable in itself. Of course, we have educators as well, Sister Athiyah is on our team. She has a master's in education from Johns Hopkins University. Sister Hannah to Abbas, I don't know if she's here. She's also a uh, master's from Johns Hopkins. Sister Farah Ahmed, who's a part of our Arabic, specifically the Arabic program, uh, also has a master's in education. So we are hoping to build a team which has uh, educators, specifically our faculty members, our administrators, are people that take education very seriously, that, that actually have a history of uh, you know, following that uh, on an academic basis, inshallah. And they also have work experience as well. You, uh, our educators are, have, are currently at Bellsville Academy, uh, have taught at Ar-Rahma School, Payne Branch High School and others, so inshallah. So these are very, very holistic educators and they have uh, interaction in multiple environments as well. School structure, okay, so we, we can all read that. I'm not gonna read that right off, off from what, what's there, but we're planning <clears throat> on, based on our own constraints, based on our own wherewithal, uh, this environment, PGMA has a Sunday school, which you're all aware of, and we also have a, a pre-kindergarten, and we have a kindergarten. The point of the Elm Tree Academy is to, is to have that transition. So what happens to these children that are in kindergarten now? They either go to another school somewhere else, or they end up in public school, and that's, that's tragic that they end up in public school. Or they get homeschooled, depending on how available the, the mom is to be able to spend time with their children. But we want to be able to have a, right here at PGMA a full-time primary school, which will literally begin where the KG ends, where the Anur KG ends, and Sheikh Yusuf Salatin is here to answer your questions. But the point is that any child that goes to pre-kindergarten and then goes to kindergarten will then immediately transition into Elm Tree Academy, which is separate from a Noor, but from the child's perspective, from the parent's perspective, that transition, inshallah, will be seamless. It should be a very smooth transaction. And so we will begin based on community uh, demand. Muslims tend to enroll their children very late. They sometimes enroll their children after the school has begun. But we will assess the grades that we will offer based on the applications we get. So you, you need to ap apply now because you may apply later on and we may not be offering that grade, which is a bad situation for you as a parent. But we will, inshallah, begin with first through fourth grade or first through fifth grade if that demand is there. Um, and then once we make that determination, then that top level grade, inshallah, we will, we will grow with, with our, our top level students, inshallah. So we retain them. So fifth grade next year and then sixth, inshallah, go into middle school and hopefully, inshallah, uh, into high school. Because the point is to be able to impart this education across all, all 12th grades, inshallah. So we are assessing the demand for a fifth grade, but we have, have pretty much decided that for now, it'll be first through fourth at least, inshallah. All right. So PGM is a, it's a great place to be, right? Yes? No? Yes? Yes. You should all raise your hands. You're, getting, you're being recorded. So why um, PGMA is, we, we actually selected, we, we had considered, I'll be honest, we had considered uh, locating Elm Tree elsewhere, you know, running our own space and just basically being independent. There, there are a lot of benefits in that. There, there are a lot of disadvantages to that as well. Uh, there are benefits to being in a masjid. There are sometimes political issues that come up when you're with a masjid, but inshallah, we're starting off our uh, uh, relationship in the, in the right direction. PGMA has, has some very good things going for them. And these are the specific advantages that, that we looked at, a lot of plus points. Number one, the classrooms are already here. Are they here or here? Over there? Okay. So they have very spacious classrooms, uh, which they're currently using for Sunday school and for uh, pre-kindergarten. There is a musalla. Your children need to see people praying. If you are not praying at home, that's, that's very bad. But if you are, that's a good thing, because your children 
will only read Quran when they see you reading Quran. They will only wear hijab if they see you wearing hijab, sisters. They will only speak the truth if they see you speaking the truth. If they see you swearing, they'll swear. One of the top reasons why children swear is actually not from, they don't learn swear words from school. One of the, one of the main reasons, and this is an embarrassment for us to know, that children learn curse words and learn how to anger, get angry and use bad language is because they see their parents doing it. So you have to make sure that your children are, are seeing you doing the things that, that they, you want them to do when they grow up. So if that's not happening, having a prayer space is important. So inshallah they can come see, they can see the Qari, the Imam reciting and then you know, have, be a part of congregational prayer. There is a computer lab available here. There are sports amenities available here, which is, which is good for the holistic education of our children to have PE. There's a playground, and of course for parents, a lot of us work in the district. Some of us work right here in Maryland, others work in Northern Virginia. Uh, there are public transportation options here. So we're close to the Metro and the Mark, and we're close to the, the whole 95 artery and everything. So all of that is here, which is a good thing for, pe for commuter parents that drop off their kids and, uh, and take off. Academic curriculum. One of the things that we want to do is that we want to make sure, like, like a lot of uh, schools that, that uh, aspire to offer education where the child's uh, you know, knowledge is not lacking in any way, is that we want to make sure that, that even though we are uh, struggling and striving to give your child an Islamic education, we want to make sure that they don't lose out from the education that they would get would, you know, would they, had they been, been going to a regular standard school. So we want to make sure that things like uh, Common Core State Standards, where there's a lot of good n uh, emphasis placed on English, which is language arts, mathematics, history, and science, all of that is going to be there. So what we have in the Muslim world, as you're aware of, is that you have madrasas, which are great for memorizing Quran and learning other things, but then the child is not exposed to secular, contemporary, modern knowledge, which they need to get into college, which they need to get a job, obviously, right? And then you have the other extreme, where you have these, these awesome grammar schools, but then the child is totally divorced from Islam. So the objective of, of primary school, uh, Islamic private schools is to, give that, is, is to give that complete sphere of education. Inshallah, we will offer that as well. On the grade school side, we will, we will have a common core state standards. And also, we're not going to be a STEM school, obviously, from, from the get-go. But we plan to hopefully, inshallah, um, include STEM, uh, STEM practices as well, and, and STEM approaches, rather, as well. If not in our school, then certainly in our after-school programs, inshallah, until we get to that level as well. Uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. One example that I like to give, and I've given it before, is a lot of us may have attended the 1001 Inventions exhibition that was at the National Geographic. I actually went all the way to New York just to catch it, because I didn't know it was coming to DC. And then it started in, I think, um, Turkey. Then it, went, it came to London, then it came to New York, then they went to Cali, then they came to DC. Now it's, it's going on off to Malaysia or something. If you look at what made Muslims great, you have the Sahaba and you have that generation as well. If you look at the so-called golden age of Islam, when we were teaching people the things coming out of Spain that the rest of Europe didn't know about, if you look at what made Muslims great, and all of these people that had excelled in science, they all had knowledge of Quran. Many of them were Hafad. The non-Arabs knew Arabic, even though they didn't speak it as their first language. Abu Hanifa is a great example. Imam Bukhari is another example. These people excelled in Islamic arts, even though they went into further on into philosophy, into mathematics, into surgery. When you go to 1001 Inventions, every one of those people there, with the exception of one or two women that excelled in education and provided institutions for higher knowledge like uh, Qayrawin and, and other places, every one of the people that you see in 1001 Inventions are Muslims that excelled in what? In science. So science and mastering science is a part of Muslim legacy. We need to realize that. Don't just worry about the fact that people like Bill Gates and Zuckerberg and others are making billions of dollars because they're coming up with the next big thing, which happens to be IT or technology or internet related. Even if that weren't the case, you need to realize that the great Muslims of the past didn't become great because they made a lot of money, even though they were involved in trade. The, the, the great things that the Muslims did outside of their Islamic sciences is that they made the world, the world a better place because they excelled in science. So we as Muslims cannot divorce ourselves from science. So when we talk about including STEM approaches, it's, it's a part of Islamic legacy. We need to have that focus on, on science, inshallah, whether it's biology or computer engineering, whatever the case may be, inshallah. Definitely a focus on science. So there are three things that I'll talk about real, real fast. Two of them are kind of fused, uh, and that's the Arabic program. So the two main uh, focuses that we have 
is that we have a focus on, on Arabic fluency and on the integrated Quran, which is your child learns Quran as they learn you know, uh, regular education. The Arabic fluency program, we are hoping to make it distinct from the other Arabic, the way Arabic is taught elsewhere. Number one, we don't want to have an excessive focus on rules. Arab and all, all these rules which are good, which you eventually learn anyway without knowing the names of these things because one of the approaches that I had personally liked is was taught by an Arab himself from Lebanon who said that he likes to teach Arabic the way a child learns a language. When a child learns a language, the first way, the first exchange of communication he hears is mom and dad talking. He doesn't learn the, the rules of Arabic and Farsi and English and Urdu. He just learns people, he sees people talking and he tries to repeat what they're saying. That's the fastest way of learning a language. You can go into the formal study of it later on, but the fastest way of learning a language is to just jump into conversation, no matter how bad your, Arab, your, your language skills are. So we want to make sure that the way in which we teach Arabic, not to neglect the rules of Arabic at all, but to make sure that the child begins learning, begins speaking the language from day one. So there will be, inshallah, a lot of focus on, on role play, on uh, you know, sentence, you know, forming a sentence, uh, all these things that we, you know, stories and interacting with the teacher, the teacher asking the class for feedback, the children speaking, because that actually makes them comfortable with speaking the language. So the way to go about it is to begin the Arabic program, and we're looking at hopefully, inshallah, 12 years. Right now, we're beginning with four years. Is to have the ch is to have the Arabic program, obviously start off in English, but gradually, year after year, week after week, month after month, to slowly phase out the English and replace it with Arabic, to the point where in the latter years of, of the of the grades, as the child progresses, the the language of instruction and the language of, of conversation will only be in Arabic. So we totally phase out the English, inshallah. That's the way to go about it. That's our mini immersion plan for Arabic, which takes us into Islamic studies. We're talking about this. We, have, we do have some steps to finalize here, but the Islamic Studies <coughs> program may be, uh, inshallah, joint with the Arabic. What I mean that, by that is that it, one of the, uh, one of, uh, a growing trend in education now is that when a language is taught, so if I, if I enroll myself in a German fluency program, for example, instead of just teaching me German, they actually will, even though I will begin with a basic understanding of German, they will eventually teach a subject in German. So I might, when I, when I sign up for German class, I actually might be signing up for poetry in German. So they'll begin with teaching me something in my home language, they'll phase that language out, replace it with German, and in the end, I'm, I'm not just learning German for the sake of learning German, I'm, I'm also learning something in German. It could be a, a literature, it could be poetry, anything. So what we are hoping to do, if this works out, if not, then Arabic in and of itself is very powerful to have a fluency program, is to actually have Islamic studies eventually be taught in Arabic, beginning with English, phasing out the English, replacing it with Arabic. What will Islamic studies be? It'll be introduction to hadith, introduction to tafsir, basic knowledge of Quran, things that a child learns in school. But the beauty is that it's eventually taught in Arabic. So it's a very good thing. We're not a full-blown immersion program because the other subjects are in English, but obviously the classes will be interactive as you can see. And the purpose of that is to make the child fluent with their conversational skills, inshallah. And then, of course, this is our flagship right here. This, who, does it, who doesn't know about the integrated trip that we're offering? Everyone knows? Okay, that's good. One brother doesn't know. Okay, you're honest. I'm sure there's more than one. All right, so <clears> Hift <throat> is a good thing, right? A lot of, ever since I was a child, I saw, and I wasn't blessed with this myself, uh, you know, parents pulling out their children from school for three years, four years, four was the standard, and putting them into Hift school. And the interesting thing that, that I learned later on is that I was uh, reading on a write-up that a, a person did, non-Muslim of course, on Alzheimer's. And we have Dr. Maher in the back, I'm sure he knows this very well. And this person did research on Alzheimer's and he said that one of the things that actually staves off Alzheimer's disease, which we should all be careful, we're all getting older, right? Is that he said that activities that involve the brain, that strain the brain to the point where your brain actually gets like a bit of a workout, they actually help uh, push away Alzheimer's in older age. So the examples that he gave, mashallah, you guys, you guys are going to love this. The examples that he gave is that, number one, doing math in your head is good for you. It's good for your brain and it actually staves off Alzheimer's. Number two, learning a new language, mashallah. <laughs> learning a new language prevents Alzheimer's disease because you're, you're engaging your brain. And the third thing he said is memorization ex exercises. Memorization exercises are good for you. And this is why some of our Sahaba were professional memorizers because Ashab al Sufa and others used to memorize the Quran. Every time the Prophet said something, they would, they would document it. Some of them would not even document it. 
and they would remember it. This is, these, are the, these are our predecessors. These are the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The point is that when you learn a foreign language, in this example, of course, it's Arabic, not foreign, but another language, and when you memorize the Quran, those, even if you did not believe in Islam, even if a person were an outright atheist, those things are good for you. They, they, they have that benefit in of themselves as well. They're good for your brain, right? But of course, for us as Muslims, as believers, there's a spiritual benefit to that as well. But Allah gives you a dunya benefit for it as well. And it's like fasting. Fasting is good for you, even if you don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, we do it not for weight loss or for other benefits, but we do it because we're told to do it. But Allah gives you that side benefit on the side. There's a benefit just to acquiring knowledge. It's, it's just good for you. It'll, it'll help you in old age. So integrated hifth is different from my child taking a break from their school and then going off to hifth school for four years. We are going to incorporate hifth in the education of the child. And realize that for the, the early Muslims, Nothing began unless there was no foundation in the Qur'an. Nothing began. So when a person, when you hear about Ar-Razi and Ibn Rushd and all these Abaroas and Ibn Sina and others, they all began as memorizers of Qur'an. You do not see a person excelling in dunya from the classical Muslim people, scholars, except that they already had grounded themselves in Islam. In not, even the Mu'tazila, the, the Mu'tazila people, even they had memorized the Qur'an. They were very smart. They had a lot of texts memorized. There's a story that I'm going to quickly share based on this slide, even though it's not specifically about Elm Tree Academy. You know, one of our, our top scholars always had one or two students that were like their, their biggest fans. Ibn Taymiyyah had such a student, right? Ibn Al-Qayyim al Jawzi, al Dhahabi, Ibn Kathir. Another scholar who had students that would do anything for him is Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, rahimahullah. Imam Al-Imam al azam is what he's called, the greatest Imam. He had students like Zufar, Qadi, Abu Yusuf, and a, and a student that we should all know, his name is Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani. You need to know about him. Why? Because Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani is one of the teachers of Imam al-Shafi'i. He was a young man and he wanted to learn from Imam Abu Hanifa. So he went up and he went to, I, I actually already said the story in a khutbah that I gave here. He went up to the academy of Abu Hanifa and one of the Abu Hanifa students opened the school and he said, I want to learn from the fiqh of Abu Hanifa. This young boy who was probably a teenager maybe even younger, goes up and he says, I want to learn. And so the students of Abu Hanifa said, okay, okay, all right, are you, do, you, do you have the Qur'an? Meaning, have you memorized the Qur'an? And he said, no. So they said, all right. And they shut the door in his face. <laughs> if that were to happen to you and me, we would, we would lose our spirit and we would go fishing or go to Disney World or do something else, right? Like I tried, didn't work out, eh. So the boy goes away, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, and then after two years, comes back to the academy. Someone opens the door, hey, what do you want, kid? You were here <laughs> 24 months ago. And he says, yeah, I want, to learn from the, I want to learn the fiqh of Imam Abu Hanifa. They said, okay, have you memorized the Quran? And he says, yes. And they said, all right, come on in, you see. The point is that this boy who wanted, and he becomes a, he's a scholar. I mean, there are two books called the Muwatta. There were many, many written in the time of Imam Malik. Only two have survived to this day. One is by this, this young boy, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani. The other one is by Imam Malik. No other Muatta exists. These, that which is done for the sake of Allah lasts up until the Day of Judgment. This boy was, had such a strong desire to learn from Abu Hanifa, he went ahead and memorized the Qur'an on his own. The point is that no matter which discipline you want to go into, whether it's Hadith or Tafsir or the, the Ten Recitations or whatever the case may be, History, Tariq, it all begins with the Qur'an. So when we cut off, when we have schools that have Islamic studies, and they have hadith, and they have Arabic, which are good things, but there's no Qur'an, you have, to, you have to break away from this to learn Qur'an somewhere else for four years. It's doable, it's not a bad thing, but there, there's a better model, which is that education should not be offered at, at the cost of Qur'an, at the expense of Qur'an. I'm not a hafiz today, I wish I was a hafiz, I didn't have that opportunity, but I hope that my children, and inshallah our children, have that opportunity, so we have integrated hifd as a part of the program as well. And of course, the hifth will be, and you can see the progression. We began with qaida if the child doesn't know how to read, and then go into uh, reading with tajweed, and finally into recitation. But what we want to do <coughs> is to offer that hifth across 12 years. So with, your, the, with the other option of your child going, going into a, you know, a four-year cram session, your child then has the hifth spread out over 12 years. We're beginning, of course, with, you know, with four years, but as the school grows, we will, inshallah, spread the hifth out. Does that mean that your child will become a hafid? Are we promising and guaranteeing your child will become a hafid? No, we're not. Because it's, it's up to every child's aptitude, right? Hifth schools 
sometimes have to kick out children because they're just not geared for flip that happens. But if your child does have that talent, if your child has a determination, if your child has the aptitude, then the tools are going to be there. Even if the child does not become a half with at least he will have one juice memorized, won't he? The 30th juice, at least he, he may have 10 juice memorized. He may have half of the Quran memorized. It's better than nothing. So inshallah, that'll be a part of the education and it should really be a part of every Islamic school's education, we believe. Student-teacher ratio. What does student-teacher ratio mean? Someone tell me. What does that mean? Number of students to the teacher. Number of? Students to the teacher, yeah, that's what it means. So student-teacher ratio, now student-teacher ratio is, is actually very important. If you study the, the top uh, private schools in this country and elsewhere, I, I don't know about you know, Europe and other places, one of the things that allow the child to really absorb well the material that is taught in class is when there are not 50 kids in the, in the class. And the last kid is 15 rows away and he's playing on his Game Boy or whatever they have these days, PS4, and the teacher doesn't know what's going on and he doesn't know what the teacher is saying. Small class sizes benefit the teacher. So the teacher doesn't have to yell the way I'm yelling and the child in the back can also hear. So when you have a small class size, the, the child is obviously better able to absorb what the teacher is saying. A good number that you will see in a lot of private schools, at least in the USA, is a ratio of 15 to 1, 1 being the teacher obviously. Not 15 teachers to one student, 15 students to one teacher. And, and 20 is really as high as you should go. So we actually aspire to uh, retain that ratio. What that means, and it's actually bad news for people that are lazy and slow, is that if we open up a grade, so we're going from first to fourth grade, right? And we are able to reach our max of 20 children per grade. Now if we get 40 kids for a certain grade, it's entirely possible that we would open up a second class. Not a second grade, but a second class. So instead of putting 40 kids in fourth grade, we actually have two classrooms of fourth grade where you have 20 kids in this classroom, 20 kids in that classroom, so you can accommodate all the kids and maintain the low student-teacher ratio, yes. But if we get 21 kids because brother X registered you know, on the first day of school, and that 21st child and that 22nd child, now we don't really have enough students to uh, justify a second class, we will probably not be able to accommodate your child. So if you're thinking about enrolling, I'm not telling you to enroll, but if you're thinking about enrolling, you're better off not delaying it, because if we meet that quota, we're not able to promise you that we'll open up a second classroom. So inshallah, you need to, you need to retain that sense of urgency, because we will have to maintain that student-teacher ratio, because we're not going to have a classroom with, with a huge number of kids, because we've a lot of us have seen what, what that results in with existing Islamic schools. So. <clears throat> that uh, is the bulk of our presentation. I'll just quickly breeze over the rest. We're hiring. Um, you can actually go to our website, which is dormitoryacademy.org. We are interested in is Islamic uh, studies teachers, in uh, Quran teacher, Hifth teacher, and uh, teachers that are uh, specialized in the Arabic program, uh, with Fusha, obviously. And if, and if you are interested in applying, then uh, <coughs> we are looking for people that ha have at least a bachelor's level degree in their, um, in their interested field of study. Parental involvement. So what we want to do is because you just have, you have certain parents that kind of don't want to have a whole lot to do with education, that are lazy. So what we want to do is that we want to make sure that we produce an environment. Number one, when we receive any feedback from a parent, that feedback is listened to. That you don't, you know, write something out, put it in a suggestion box, and it just, psh, it just disappears and no one ever hears about it. Or you send an email, no one replies, all right? We don't want to do that. So we want to make sure that we have a school where there is, an, there is attention and due respect given to a parent. You're not just someone who, hey, you got to go that way. <laughs> and sit down. All right, Jazakallah khair, young brother. Your turn will come, inshallah, in, in a couple of decades. <laughs> so, um, so we want to make sure that, that parents are, you know, we actually are able to receive feedback from parents. When we offer after-school programs, and that's in the coming slides, than any parent who has a talent. So suppose we have this 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. school, but every day of the week, Monday a separate program, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we want to have an after-school program, so like a science program, Lego robotics, or an, a follow-up to the HIF, or something else, like maybe a, a, a nature program where there's appreciation for the environment and the ecology that's taught. If there's a parent who has a certain talent and he wants to bring that talent to the school, he will be allowed to. So if I have an after-school parent uh, program of martial arts, right? Two hours, at, uh, uh, you know, on a everyday martial arts, and we have a parent in the community who's a black belt in something, Taekwondo or whatever, 
and he or she wants to be a teacher, a teacher for the sisters, a teacher for the brothers, then we want to be able to extend that opportunity for them to be a part of the school. So you can be with your kids. I have a good friend that I, he's, he's a recent friend that I made and he had never been a part of camping. He lives in the Adam Center community and he had been contacted by the youth director there to, to join in. And this year he actually went and he became a um, substitute, you know, Cub Scouts, whatever, troop leader or whatever, whatever it's called. And one of the reasons why he went is because his kids were going. He wanted to just be with his kids. He didn't want to literally be a part of the troop that his kids were in because that's just that's too much daddy. You don't, want, you don't want to see that much of your dad. But he went because he wanted to be with his children. So your involvement in an after-school program, in, in, being in, in any capacity joining with the school, being the chair of a committee, is really closeness to your child. The way a mother who's a teacher comes on board and she can be with her child, you as a father will be afforded that responsibility. And, and, uh, and that's actually a very good thing. So, so parents will be assigned the responsibility to run committees and enrich the school. Why did I lose my focus again? Okay, it got better. And so we will also have a parent-teacher association where parents can also be a part of all that stuff. So extracurricular opportunities. So these are just examples. We actually made a list of all the extracurricular options that we plan to offer and the list got so big that it was like 90, thing, 90 different items and we stopped writing. We were like, okay, that's too much. So anyway, so, so we, I think we already have Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts here? Girl, girl. girl okay. So, so, you know, having Boy Scouts here is an option. Lego Robotics is actually very easy to get into your, into your school. Your kids actually like that a lot. My son was in Lego Robotics. Um, having sports, making use of these amenities, these facilities that we have after school programs, even having like a team, uh, not a full-fledged varsity team, but a team per se. STEM activities, following up after the school, that those are options as well having a science club, having an arts club, all these things outside of, you know, getting your uh, general education and memorizing Quran and Arabic, stuff that makes school fun, stuff that makes school environment, you know, like a fun environment to be with your children, doesn't have to be academic, could be academic if that need is there, needs to be offered and we're going to offer that inshallah. Your children need to be encouraged to come to school. School should not be a nuisance that they never want to go to. They need to look forward to going to school. They need to look forward to going to the masjid, inshallah. And the purpose of these programs is to offer that. And lastly, of course, community service. Respect for the environment, respect for the ecology, treating plants with respect. Plants, plants deserve our respect. Our prophet hugged a tree. A tree cried for him and he hugged a tree. Today, you know the word tree hugger is a dirty word. He was, ah, he's a tree hugger. Yeah, well, our, our prophet was a tree hugger, so what? I'm a tree hugger because I have to follow his sunnah. So there you go. So respect for plants, respect for animals, these things are documented in the hadith. Allah rewards those who, tr who respects the things that he has created. So community service, being a part of society, you know, helping a blind woman cross the street, even if she is Christian, all these things have to be taught to our children. We will inshallah have that as well. Okay, more information. If you have any questions, <clears throat> you can uh, visit our website. There's a lot of information on the website. You can email us, inshallah. Um, you, can, uh, you can link up with us on Twitter and everything. And if you, if you insist, if you have to, write us a letter. All right? And we may reply. I don't know. <laughs> I hope we do. No, inshallah, we will. But, but there are faster ways of reaching out to us. But uh, if you have any questions, it's, if something comes up, you can, inshallah, reach out to us, and we will respond to your questions. Jazakallah khairan. What I wanted to do is um, open the floor to questions.